Section 6 of Astounding Stories 6, June 1930. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Murder Madness by Murray Leinster. Chapter 9. There was the sound of weeping in the house, the gusty and hopeless weeping of women. Bell had been walking around and around the plain, staring at it with his hands clenched. Paula watched him. I am thinking, she said, in an attempt in an attempt at courage, that you said I must not despair without your permission, but Hush, said Bell impatiently. He stared at the engine. I'd give a lot for a car. Bolts. How many hours have we? Four, said Paula drearily. Perhaps five. You smashed the radio in the house? Bell nodded impatiently. He had smashed the radio. A marvelously compact and foolproof outfit, arbitrarily tuned to a fixed shortwave length. It was almost as simple to operate as a telephone. There had been no opposition to the destruction. Paula's cousin had disabled their plane and reported their presence. He was inside the house now, sick with shame, and yet he would do the same again. In one of the rooms of the house, behind strong bars, a man was kept who had been an object lesson. "'Is there any machinery?' asked Bell desperately. "'Any at all about the place?' Paula shook her head. "'It may be that there is a pump.' Bell went off savagely hunting it. He came back and dived into the cockpit of the plane. He came out with a wrench, and his jaws set grimly. He worked desperately at the pump. He came back with two short, thick bolts. He crawled into the plane again, tearing out the firewall impatiently, getting up under the motor. We have one chance in five thousand, he said grimly from there, of getting away from here to crash in the jungle. Personally, I prefer that to falling into Ribiera's hands. If your cousin or anyone else comes near us out here, call me, and I'll be much obliged. There was the sound of scraping, patient, desperate, wholly unpromising scraping. It seemed to go on for hours. The wrench, please, Paula. She passed it to him. The bullet had entered the aluminum crankcase of the motor and pierced it through. By special providence, it had not struck the crankshaft, and had partly penetrated the crankshaft on the other side. Bell had cut it out, first of all. He had two holes in the crankcase, then, through which the cylinder oil had drained away. And of all pieces of machinery upon earth, an aircraft motor requires oil. Bell's scraping had been to change the punctured holes of the bullet into cone-shaped bores. The aluminum alloy was harder than pure aluminum, of course, but he'd managed it with a knife. Now he fitted the short bolts into the bores, forced the grooves on them to cut their own grooves, and by main strength he screwed it into a fit. He tightened them. He came out with his eyes glowing oddly. The vibration will work them loose sooner or later, he observed grimly, and they may not be oil-tight. Also the crankshaft may clear them, and it may not. If we go up in the ship in this state, we may get five miles away, or five hundred. At any minute it may fail us, and sooner or later it will fail us. Are you game to go up, Paula? She smiled at him. With you, of course. He began to brush off his hands. There ought to be oil and gas here, he said briefly. Another thing, there'll probably be some metal chips in the crankcase, which may stop an oil line at any minute. It's... A form of committing suicide, I imagine. He went off, hunting savagely for the supplies of fuel and lubricant which would be stored at any emergency field. He found them. He was pouring gasoline into the tanks before what he was doing was noticed. Then there was stunned amazement in the house. When he had the crankcase full of oil, the young man came out. Bell tapped his revolver suggestively. With no man about this house, he said grimly, Ribiera will put in one of his own choice, and you have a wife and children, and they'll be at that man's mercy. Don't make me kill you. Ribiera may not blame you for my escape if you tell him everything, and you're hurt anyway. 
Either we get away and you do that, or you're killed and we get away anyhow. He toppled two last five-gallon tins of gasoline into the cockpits, crowding them abominably, and swung on the prop. The engine caught. Bell throttled it down, kicked away the stones with which he had blocked its wheels, and climbed up into the pilot's cockpit. With his revolver ready in his lap, he taxied slowly over to a favorable starting point. The ship rose slowly and headed west again. At three thousand feet, he cut out the motor to shout to Paula. One place is as good as another to us now. The whole continent is closed to us by now. I'm going to try to find that headquarters and do some damage. Afterwards, we'll see. He cut in the motor again and flew steadily westward. He rose gradually to four thousand feet, to five. He watched his instruments grimly, the motor temperature especially. There were flakes of metal in the oil lines. Twice he saw the motor temperature rise to a point that brought the sweat out on his face. And twice he saw it drop again. Bits of shattered metal were in the oiling system, and they had partly blocked the stream of lubricant until the engine heated badly, and each time the vibration had shifted them, or loosened them. They had left the big amphibian no earlier than nine o'clock. It was noon when they took off for the fazenda of Paula's kin, but it was five o'clock and after when they rose from there with an engine that might run indefinitely and might stop at any second. Bell did not really expect it to run for a long time. He had worked as much to cheat Riviera of the satisfaction of a victory as in hopes of a real escape. But an hour and the motor still ran. It was consistently hotter than an aero engine should run. Twice it had gone up to a dangerous temperature. Another time it had gone up for a minute or more as if the oiling system had failed altogether. But it still ran, and the sun was sinking toward the horizon, and shadows were lengthening, and Bell began to look almost hopefully for a clearing in which to land before the dark hours came. Then it was that he saw the planes that had been sent for him and for Paula. There were three of them, fast two-seaters, very much like the one he drove. They were droning eastward, with all cockpits filled, from that enigmatic point in the west, and Bell had descended to investigate a barely possible stream when they saw him. The leader banked steeply and climbed upward toward him. The others gazed, swung sharply, and came after him, spreading out as they came. And Bell, after one instant's grim debate, went into a maple-leaf dive for the jungle below him. The others dived madly in his wake. He heard a sharp, tearing rattle, a machine gun. He saw the streaks of tracers going very wide. Gunfire in the air is far from accurate. A machine gun burst from a hundred yards when the gun has to be aimed by turning the whole madly vibrating ship is less accurate than a rifle at six hundred or even eight. Most aircraft duels are settled at distances of less than a hundred yards. It was that fact that Bell counted on. With a motor that might go dead at any instant, and a load of passengers and gas at least equaling that of any of the other ships, mere flight promised little. The other ships, too, were armed, at any rate, the leader was, and Bell had only small arms at his disposal. But a plane pilot, stunting madly to dodge tracer bullets, has little time to spare for revolver work. Bell had but one advantage. He expected to be killed. He looked upon both Paula and himself as very probably dead already, and he infinitely preferred the clean death of a crash to either the life or death that Ribiera would offer them. He flattened out barely twenty yards above the wavering branches that are the roof of the jungle. He went scudding over the treetops, rising where the jungle rose, dipping where it dropped, and behind him the foliage waved wildly as if in a cyclone. The other planes dared not follow. To dive upon him meant too much chance of a dash into the entrapping branches. One plane indeed did try it, and Bell scudded lower and lower until the wheels of the small plane were spinning from occasional breathtaking contacts with the feathery topmost branches of jungle giants. 
That other plane flattened out not less than a hundred feet farther up and three hundred yards behind. To fire on him with a fixed gun meant a dive to bring the gun muzzle down, and a dive meant a crash. A stream flashed past below. There was the glitter of water, reflecting the graying sky. A downward current here dragged at the wings of the plane. Bell jerked at the stick, and her nose came up. There was a clashing, despite her climbing angle, of branches upon the running gear. But she broke through and shot upward, trying to stall. Bell flung her down again into his mad careening. It was not exactly safe, of course. It was practically a form of suicide. But Bell had not death, but life, to fear. He could afford to be far more reckless than any man who desired to live. The plane went scuttling madly across the jungle tops, now rising to skim the top of a monster sieba, now dipping deliberately. The three pursuing planes hung on above him helplessly while the short, short twilight of the tropics fell, and Bell went racing across the jungle, never twenty feet above the treetop, and with the boughs behind him showing all the agitation of a miniature hurricane. As darkness deepened, the race became more suicidal still and there were no lighted fields nearby to mark a landing place. But as darkness grew more intense, Bell could dare to rise to fifty, then a hundred feet above the tops, and the dangers of diving to his level remained undiminished. And then it was dark. Bell climbed to two hundred feet, to two hundred and fifty. With more freedom now, he could take one hand from the controls. He could feel the menace of the tumultuously roaring motors in his wake, but he was smiling strangely in the blackness, he reached inside his flying suit and tore away the front of his shirt. He reached down and battered in the top of one of the five-gallon gasoline tins in the cockpit with the barrel of his revolver. He stuffed the scrap of cloth into the rent. It was wetted instantly by the splashing. Another savage blow, unheard in the thunder of the motor, in the peculiarly calm air of the cockpit, the reek of gasoline was strong, but cleared away. And Bell, with the frosty grim smile of a man who gambles with his life, struck a light. The cloth flared wildly, and he reached his hands into the flame and heaved the tin of fuel overside. The cloth was burning fiercely and spilled gasoline caught in mid-air. The fierce and savage flame dropped earthward. Spark on the cloth and the cloud of inflammable vapor that formed where the leaking tin fell plummet-like. Carried the flame down when the wind of its fall would have blown it out. The following plane saw a flash of light. They saw a swiftly descending conflagration, tracing a steep arch toward the treetops. They saw that flaming vanish among the trees. And then they saw a vast upflaring of fire below. Flames looked upward almost to the treetops. Bell looked back from two thousand feet. Wingtip lights were on below, and disks of illumination played upon the roof of the jungle above the fire. The three planes were hovering over the spot but a thick, dense column of smoke was rising now. Green things shriveled in the heat and dried and rotted under brush. Altogether, the volume of smoke and flame was very convincing evidence that an airplane had burst into flame in midair and crashed through the jungle top to burn to ashes beneath. But Bell climbed steadily to five thousand feet. He cut the motor there, and in the shrieking and whistling wind, as the plane went into a shallow glide, he spoke sharply. Paula! I am all right, she assured him unsteadily. What now? There's a seat pack under you, said Bell. It's a parachute. You had better put it on. God only knows where we'll land, but if the motor stops, we'll jump together. And I think we'll have to jump before dawn. This plane won't fly indefinitely. There's just one chance in a million that I know of. There'll be a moon before long. When it comes up, look for the glitter of moonlight on water. With the wingtip lights, we may, we may, manage to get down, but I doubt it. He moved his hand to cut in the motor again. She stopped him. If we head south, she said unsteadily, we may reach the Paraguay. It is perhaps two hundred miles. But it is broad. We should see it, perhaps even the stars. Good work, said Bell approvingly. Niels desperandum. That's our motto, Paula. He swung off his course and headed south. He was flying high now, 
and an illogical and incomprehensible hope came to him. There was no hope, of course. He had had more than once a despairing conviction that the utmost result of all his efforts would be but the delaying of their final enslavement to the master, whose apparent impersonality made him the more terrible as he remained mysterious. So far they seemed like struggling flies in some colossal web, freeing themselves from one snaring spot to blunder helplessly into another. But the moon came up presently, rounded and nearly full. The sky took on a new radiance, and the jungle below them was made darker and more horrible by the contrast. And when there were broad stretches of moonlit foliage visible on the rising slopes beneath, Bell felt the engine faltering. He switched on the instrument board light. One glance and he was cold all over. The motor was hot, hotter than it had ever been. The oil lines, perhaps the pump itself. Paula's hand reached back into the glow of the instrument board. He leaned over and saw her pointing. Moonlight on rolling water far below. He dived for it steeply. The wing lights went out. Faint disks of light appeared far below, sweeping to and fro with the swaying of the plane bobbing back and forth. It seemed to Bell that there had been nothing quite as horrible as the next minute or two. He felt the overheated, maltreated motor laboring. It was being ruined, of course, and a ruined motor meant that they were marooned in the jungle. But if it kept going only until they landed, and if it did not. White water showed below the disks of the landing light's glow. It tumbled down a swift and deadly radal, a rapid and then black, deep water moving swiftly between tall cliffs of trees. Bell risked everything to bank about and land toward the white water. The little plane seemed to be sinking into a canyon as the trees rose overhead on either side, but the moonlit rapid gave him his height, approximately, and the lights helped more than a little. He landed with a terrific crash. The plane teetered on the very verge of a dive beneath the surface. Bell jerked back the stick and killed the engine, and it settled back. A vast, a colossal silence succeeded the deafening noise of twelve cylinders exploding continuously. There were little hissing sounds as the motor cooled. There was the smell of burnt oil. "'All right, Paula?' asked Bell quietly. "'I'm... I'm all right.' The plane was drifting backward now. It spun around in a stately fashion, its tail caught in underbrush, and it swung back, it drifted past cliffs of darkness for a long time, and grounded presently with a surprising gentleness. "'Do you know,' said Bell dryly, "'this sort of thing is getting monotonous. I think our motor's ruined. I never knew before that misfortunes could grow literally tedious. I've been expecting to be killed any minute since we started off, but the idea of being stuck in the jungle with a perfectly good plane and a bad motor—' He fished inside his flying suit and extracted a cigarette. Then he lit it. Let's see, we haven't a thing to eat, have we? There was a little slapping noise. Bell became suddenly aware of a horde of insects swarming around him. Smoke served partially to drive them off. Look here, he said suddenly. We could unfold a parachute and cover the cockpits for some protection against these infernal things that are biting me. We may need the parachute, said Paula unsteadily. Does... Does that smoke of yours drive them away? A little, Bell hesitated. I say, it would be crowded, but if I came up there or you here... I'll... I'll come back there, she said queerly. The extra cans of gasoline here. She slipped over the partition in the odd flying suit, which looks so much more odd when a girl wears it. She settled down beside him, and he tried painstakingly to envelop her in a cloud of tobacco smoke. The plague of insects lessened. There was nothing to do but wait for dawn. She was very quiet, but as the moon rose higher, he saw that her eyes were open. The night noises of the jungle all about them came to their ears. Furtive little slitherings, and the sound of things drinking greedily at the water's edge, and once or twice peculiar little despairing animal cries off in the distance. The jungle was dark and sinister, and all the more so when the moon rose high and lightened its face and left them looking into weird, abysmal blackness between moonlit branches. Bell thought busily, trying not to become too conscious of the small, warm body beside him. 
He moved suddenly and found her fingers closed tightly on the sleeve of his flying suit. Frightened, Paula? he asked quietly. Don't be. We'll make it out. She shook her head and looked up at him, drawing away as if to scan his face more closely. I am thinking, she said almost harshly, of biology. I wonder. Bell waited. He felt an intolerable strain in her tensed figure. He put his hand comfortingly over hers, and astoundingly he found it trembling. "'Are all women fools?' she demanded in a desperate cynicism. "'Are we all imbeciles?' "'Are—' Bell's pulse pounded suddenly. He smiled. "'Not unless men are imbeciles, too,' he said dryly. "'We've been through a lot in the past two days. It's natural that we should like each other. We've worked together rather well. I—well, his smile was distinctly a wry and uncomfortable one. I've been the more anxious to get to some civilized place where the master hasn't a deputy, because, well, it wouldn't be fair to talk about loving you while... He shrugged and said curtly, while you had no choice but to listen. She stared at him, there in the moonlight, with the jungle moving about its business of life and death about them, and very, very slowly the tenseness left her figure. And very, very slowly she smiled. Perhaps, she said quietly, you are lying to me, Charles. Perhaps. But it is a very honorable thing for you to say. I am not ashamed now of feeling that I wish to be always near you. Hush, said Bell. He put his arm about her shoulder and drew her closer to him. He tilted her face upward. It was oval and quite irresistibly pretty. I love you, said Bell steadily. I've been fighting it since God knows when, and I'm going to keep on fighting it, and it's no use. I'm going to keep on loving you until I die. Her fingers closed tightly upon his. Bell kissed her. Now, he said gruffly, go to sleep. He pressed her head upon his shoulder and kept it there. After a long time she slept. He stirred much later, and she opened her eyes again. What is it? Damn these mosquitoes, growled Bell. I can't keep them off your face. End of chapter 9